Hello and welcome to Perspectives, the weekly edition. I'm Sebastian Gomes, your guest host for this very special episode looking at the effort to find a common date for Easter between the churches of the East and the West. You may be surprised to learn that Christians around the world do not celebrate Easter on the same day. It all depends on whether a church follows the Julian calendar, which was established by Julius Caesar in 46 BC, or the Gregorian calendar, established by Pope Gregory XIII in 1582. Though efforts have been made to unify the date of Easter, not much has changed since the 16th century. But in May of 2014, Pope Tawadros II, the leader of the Coptic Orthodox Church headquartered in Egypt, sent a letter to Pope Francis asking him to help unify the dates of Easter. Francis, who has proven to be a bold advocate for Christian unity, has not initiated anything officially, but said in an unscripted remark at a priest's retreat last June that we have to come to an agreement regarding the date of Easter. Since then, other Christian leaders have backed the proposal, including the head of the Anglican Communion, Justin Welby, and Patriarch Aphraim II of the Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch. Now, the practical question of how a common date could be established is still up for debate. So, too, are the potential ecumenical implications. But in a world fraught with religious indifference and violence, especially against Christians, such an historic and practical accomplishment for Christian unity may signal the beginning of something far greater. Now, to help us understand the history behind the two calendars and what finding a common date could mean for global Christianity, I'm joined by Father Peter Galatza of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church. He is acting director and Kuhl Family Professor of Liturgy at the Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky Institute of Eastern Christian Studies. That's part of the University of St. Paul in Ottawa, Ontario. Father Galatza, thank you very much for joining us thank today. Thank you for having me. Before we get into the history behind the calendars themselves, let me ask you, why do you think this conversation is happening right now? Well, it's the kind of conversation that's been going on with a lot of intermittent breaks uh, throughout much of the 20th century. Uh, already in the 1920s, there were proposals made. Vatican II made a proposal. The World Council of Churches has come up with a formula, uh, the so-called Aleppo Statement. I think that it's happening right now basically because, in this case, you know, Pope Francis and Pope Tawadros of, of uh, Alexandria, of the Coptic Orthodox Church, these are, you know, dynamic leaders. Uh, you use the word bold. Uh, yeah, they're willing to, you know, break new ground, as it were, even if the ground happens to be rather old, but they're willing in a bold way to approach old issues. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people would be uh, surprise, as I mentioned in the intro, to find out that Christians actually don't celebrate Easter on the same day. Yeah. But help us to understand the difference between the two calendars. I mentioned the Julian calendar and then the Gregorian calendar it didn't come until the 16th century. But, yeah, yeah. you know, without, well, I, I, without I'm, giving I'll you an you, hour to, to get us I'm chuckling because, you know, thank God we live in the age of uh, the video. You can tape this and go back to it because it is very complicated. So I'm going to have to ask you know, the audience to, to bear with me, okay? The problem lies with the fact that the Julian calendar, which is the calendar that is still used by all of the Orthodox churches of the East, except, by the way, for the Church of Finland, the Orthodox Church of Finland, which is a, a very unique exception. But that Julian calendar is presently off by 13 days. Okay. Now you'll say, well, hold it, but you know, the difference uh, in the dates for Easter can sometimes be up to five weeks. Sometimes, by the way, occasionally it's actually the same date. So what's going on here? What's this 13 days business about? Well, it has to do with when you calculate March. 21st, okay, in other words, the spring equinox, because, this is a very important footnote here, all of the churches, whether they celebrate together or not, believe that Easter is supposed to fall on the first Sunday after the first full moon 
after the spring equinox. That was determined by the Ecumenical Council of Nicaea in the year 325. So if all of the churches believe that, why the difference? Well, the whole question is, when is the spring equinox? Now you can say, well, you can just look in your tele and you know, figure it out, right? Well, no, because you're dealing with tables that were established centuries ago. And so right now, the churches that hold to the Julian calendar for their reckoning of Easter, for them, March 21st is 13 days later. Okay, now, is, is that part clear? To me, yes. Okay, I very hope to good. everybody, yes. I, I mean, <laughs> not too many people have to, you know, record this to, to figure it out again. So the, the Gregorian calendar then, what, what, what was Pope Gregory trying to Well, accomplish? what he was, was trying to do, see, the Julian calendar ends up being late by one day, ends up being off by one day every 127 years. So when he reformed the calendar, it was off by 10 days. Okay, so for example, uh, in 1582, March 21st was actually March 31st, you know, 10 days later. So he said, well, yeah, we really don't want this, okay? Um, so he reformed the calendar, and what that meant is that you have to obviously wait for March 21st to come around, which now is earlier if you follow the Gregorian reckoning. But if you're following the Julian reckoning, you, 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 you have to wait the extra 13 days, and then you have to factor in the first Sunday after the first full moon. That's why you can get up to you know, a five-week differential. Okay, So, in, in essence, all that Pope Gregory was doing is correcting an astronomical error. Now, lest anyone think that it's only those benighted Easterners who have problems with this, most people don't realize that England itself did not accept the Gregorian calendar until the middle of the 18th century. There were riots in the streets uh, of London when you know, the British government, uh, the, the Crown, decided to adopt the Gregorian calendar. There, there was this, oh, this is, this is a sellout to the Pope, you know, this is a, you know, a Popish plot, etc. And there are all sorts of other countries that didn't accept the Gregorian calendar and, and, until later. Um, in, in the case, by the way, of, of the various, you know, Eastern churches, there was a, a strong movement to adopt the Gregorian calendar by all sorts of Eastern churches after World War I, and many of them did, which is why, for example, the Greek Orthodox Church, they celebrate Christmas on December 25th. The Romanian Orthodox Church does the same, the Antiochian Orthodox Church does the same, but what happened at that time after World War I, because in Russia it was the communists who had introduced the Gregorian calendar, the people reacted against that, and the other Orthodox churches said, okay, even though we have accepted the Gregorian calendar for the immovable cycle of feasts, you know, Christmas, etc., in order to maintain unity with, you know, the, the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, which at that time included the whole territory of, of Ukraine, etc., uh, to maintain unity with the Serbian Orthodox Church, which also didn't want to, to make the switch. We will continue nonetheless, we will continue nonetheless to um, accept the, the Julian reckoning for the date of Easter. So this, this is not just a question of, you know, the calendar or a liturgical cycle, but there's scientific uh, elements behind it. There's political elements behind it, obviously. So that all contributes to the. Well, there, there, uh, the, the political dimensions are both secular, you know, politics and ecclesiastical politics. Because um, obviously, once the Gregorian calendar becomes associated with communism, you know, who's going to go for that? Right, right? right. That's one thing. And in terms of church politics, what happens uh, in an age of, shall we say, interecclesial strife? If you really don't like the other Christian down the road, you're going to look for ways to remain separate. 
you know. And, and, and this is, you know, in the past, this has happened on the Catholic side, has happened on the Protestant side, has happened on, you know, the Orthodox side with regards to different issues. So um, in one sense, what you really need as, as a precondition, uh, I think, for the establishment of a common date for the celebration of Easter, you really need an increase in ecumenical goodwill because somebody who wants to remain apart uh, will always find a way to remain apart as long as, as you know, they really don't like you, you know, and so it's a matter of increasing love. We have to take a short break, but we're going to actually touch on the ecumenical implications or possible ecumenical implications of all of this when we get back. So short break now, but don't go anywhere. We'll be back after this. Welcome back. In this episode, we're talking about the possibility of finding a common date for Easter here with Father Peter Galatza of the Shiptitsky Institute in Ottawa. Uh, you mentioned just before the break ecumenical implications of all this. Let's, let's get into some of those. If we do find a way to achieve a common date of Easter, what will that mean ecumenically? Well, uh, I mean, I guess it's analogous to uh, what does it mean for anybody to be able to do something together at the same time. I mean, you, you've got uh, colleagues, let's say you're, you know, I mean, to take the most banal example, um, we've got a Christmas party here, but one half of your staff meets for its Christmas party uh, on one date, and for some reason, the other half of the staff meets on another day. I mean, if you're really trying to, you know, solidify unity, you know, create an esprit de corps, you're going to want to be doing things together. Now, you, you know, somebody can say, well, okay, but these are, these are, you know, people who are scattered, you know, in different countries. Well, yes and no. There are instances where you have people, you know, uh, Christians living side by side with each other but celebrating on different dates. In the Middle East, for example, you have the Melkite Greek Catholic Church. Okay, they're just like the Ukrainian Greek Catholics in that they have Orthodox traditions but they're in communion with Rome. So there they are in the Middle East, the Melkites. They celebrate Easter on the, uh, according to the Gregorian reckoning. In other words, just like, you know, most of the Catholic world, okay? Their closest counterpart in, in terms of Christianity, is the Antiochian Orthodox Church. They are so close that even though a lot of people don't talk about this, they actually, the priests themselves, not the bishops yet, but the priests themselves will actually concelebrate the Eucharist, even though they're not in full communion, okay? Just because, and it's because of the suffering that they've been, you know, they, they experience a lot of suffering, so they just have days when they say, listen, you know, we're not, we're not going to allow, you know, and they're from, they have the same roots in the Church of Antioch. But even though they are that close, the Melkites are celebrating Easter on one day, and the Antiochian Orthodox are celebrating on another. And sometimes, as this year, 2016, sometimes it can be up to five weeks apart. And it's really frustrating when, you know, one community is still in Lent, the other community is already, you know, seeing Christ is risen, you know, breaking the fast, etc. Um, so, you know, that kind of thing is, is important. I want to touch on something you, you alluded to, which was the suffering between these two Christian communities in the Middle East. Now, uh, it's pretty clear that persecution of Christians in various parts of the world has brought the churches together. And Pope Francis uses the terminology ecumenism of blood. It's something he's mentioned many times. Um, so is that, is that something that is, is driving this discussion? And... Um, is the, the date of Easter something, is it just one step on this greater path that's bringing us together? Do you see that happening in the long run? Yeah, I mean, it, it, let's put it this way, it certainly will not hurt. I don't think it's surprising that um, it's the Pope of Alexandria, in other words, the head of the Coptic Orthodox Church, and, and the, um, the, 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 Syriac, uh, the Syrian Orthodox hierarch who have come forward with this because you know, they, they feel very, very much uh, alone at times. You know, the, it's, it's, it's tragic how, you know, the Western, um, Western powers 
frequently just turn a blind eye to, to the suffering being inflicted on Christians in the Middle East, you know. So, I mean, this is a way of, of trying to heighten, you know, that, that bond with other Christians, you know, and, and hopefully the other Christians, you know, in, in North America, for example, will, you know, develop a greater sensitivity to, the, to these churches. What about, what about Pope Francis? Um, the other Christian leaders seem to be looking to him to kind of be a torchbearer in this effort. It, what, what's the reason behind that? Why is involving Pope Francis? Well, there, there's no doubt. I mean, when, when your church uh, has the numbers, you know, billion plus, uh, other churches will, will say, yeah, it's, it's, it's appropriate that the, you know, the Catholic Church lead this initiative. Um, you know, the Anglican Church will, will, will certainly um, be very interested. In fact, it's already, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury here has already said that he's, he's very, very uh, committed to, to working for this. In fact, he's, he's even said that he presumes that anywhere between, uh, within five to ten years, we will have a common date for, for Easter. But l let's put it this way. I think that uh, the Archbishop of, of, of Canterbury, in spite of you know, his, uh, the noblest intentions, I think that even if he were, for example, to decide to spearhead this, he would probably make a beeline to, to Rome to say, listen, I, w I want to propose this, but we're going to need you, you know, pope, whichever pope it might be, to, to really run with this because, you know, there's no point in, you know, the Anglicans and the Protestants uh, working on a, on a common date if, if this massive swath of, of, of Christians, in other words, the Catholic Church, uh, isn't on board. Is it possible that if Pope Francis proposes something that some of those churches will say no, or do you think everybody would, would come along for the ride? People in the West frequently forget that when we talk about orthodoxy, you know, or orthodox Christianity, we're not talking about a monolith. So first you've got Eastern Orthodoxy and then Oriental Orthodoxy, okay? And then within Eastern Orthodoxy and Oriental Orthodoxy, there are discrete, as, as it were, uh, the, the, the formal term is autocephalous, in other words, self headed churches which can decide to do something on their own even if the other Orthodox churches decide that they want to do it. So for example, in this instance, we know that um, there have been some rumblings within the Russian Orthodox Church about the fact that you know, they will not go along with any proposal that, for example, ignores the prescriptions of the Council of Nicaea. And then there's the, the, the whole question of people within the Russian Orthodox Church who don't believe that you know, the, the Gregorian reckoning is acceptable. And I want to go further into this question of the Russian Orthodox Church because it's sort of the elephant in the room, so to speak. And uh, we all remember uh, February 12th, uh, earlier this year, that Pope Francis met with Patriarch Kirill of Moscow, the first time a meeting uh, of that kind had, had ever taken place. That in turn raised some, raised some flags, especially in the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church because uh, of the war currently going on in Ukraine between Russia uh, and the Ukraine. And uh, your major archbishop, Sviatoslav Shevchuk, expressed his concern with the joint declaration that was uh, signed between Patriarch uh, Kirill and Pope Francis. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about the Russian Orthodox Church, but first here's uh, a video that CNS put together. Uh, on the meeting between Pope Francis and Patriarch Kirill. Take a look. When I have received a, a news about a upcoming meeting with uh, His Holiness Pope Francis and Patriarch Kir Kir Kirill, my spontaneous exclamation was, finally! <laughs> and I was so pleased that uh, Pope Francis repeated almost the same when he embraced uh, Patriarch uh, Kirill. And I think that uh, uh, that very gesture is sacred. We're supposed to meet, uh, we're supposed to talk, but that meeting, it's only uh, a tool, a routine, in, in order to start true, sincere dialogue. But the joint declaration which was made, uh, a big document with so many not clear statements, was problematic was the temptation to instrumentalize uh, uh, holy sacred 
issue of ecumenism for the political proposals. Uh, especially those paragraphs who, who are judging the situation in Ukraine uh, uh, almost an inner civil conflict. Uh, and also mm, some sort of, of um, not clear statement on the identity of the Eastern Catholic churches, because those churches were called simply the Christian communities. That diversity of, of uh, uh, terminology is very, very uh, difficult to understand, because um, in the ecumen ecumenical discussions, those communities who are not preserved uh, the apostolic succession, supposed to be called Christian communities. Uh, but we are churches, uh, sui iuris churches. Now, Pope Francis has since met with Archbishop Shevchuk and the Permanent Council, the Permanent Synod of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church, reaffirming their communion. Archbishop Shevchuk saying afterwards, uh, Pope Francis heard us. Uh, now, Father, tell us about the issue with the Russian Orthodox Church. Why do they, in a sense, complicate the ecumenical discussion, and, and how might that factor into this question of finding a common date for Easter? One of the, the, the problems is that because of their history, the Russian Orthodox Church um, frequently feels that it's under attack. Okay. We all know that as long as you feel threatened, and it's really tragic that they do, because I don't think there's any reason for Russia or the Russian Orthodox Church to feel threatened, but as long as you feel threatened, you are going to view changes that bring you in line with the customs practices of your perceived enemy to be problematic. So the acceptance of a unified date for Easter will be perceived, especially among the, the, the more traditional or sort of traditionalist circles of Russian Orthodoxy, that will be perceived as, as caving in to Catholicism, Protestantism, whatever, you know. And so the authorities within the Russian Orthodox Church have to deal with that, you know. They, they've got their peanut gallery that, that they have to worry about, and it, it can be, you know, substantial. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's really, really ironic, but uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm of the mind uh, that, quite frankly, the only way you're actually going to get a unified, a common date for Easter is for Western Christians to perform a profound act of humility. It'll be a profound act of humility because they, they would actually be, you know, agreeing to a mistake, a mathematical, astronomical mistake. Um, but th it's the only way that I foresee a, a common date of Easter is if Pope Francis were to say, I know that, you know, I know when March 21st is, but for the sake of unity. And by the way, going against one of his predecessors, Gregory, who changed. Precisely, precisely, precisely. But for the sake of unity, because most people, I mean, the vast majority of Roman Catholics, Protestants, they don't, you know, for them, whether Easter is, is two Sundays earlier, two Sundays later, you know, whatever, I mean, it would end up frequently being later, never earlier. Um, you know, it's, it's a movable Sunday anyway, you know. So um, that is really the only way that I, I foresee uh, a solution because all of the other solutions that have been proposed are solutions that I think the, the real, real hardcore traditionalists within the Eastern churches will reject. Well, we're going to have to leave it at that. Thank you very much, Father. Now remember, you can always get in touch with us at Salt and Light by phone or email. We'd love to hear from you, and be sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and visit our website to watch more episodes of Perspectives, the weekly edition. Thanks for joining us today. For Deacon Pedro, I'm Sebastian Gomes. Take care. <laughs>